just love this idea. I said, we should tell a story about Magnus and the Five on the eve of D-Day, and they're there to stop something, and Drew, it's a Nazi, and, uh, and here's the kicker is that, you know, at the end of Act Two, when, you know, the Invisible Man ends up being chased by Nazis, he runs into a, a newly parachuted in platoon of uh, American paratroopers led by Will's grandfather. And that was always just kind of the pitch. And I knew that once it was out, Martin would just grab it and never let go of it because I knew this was his kind of story. And so that's exactly what happened. Sanctuary can take things from the last 160 years and make them our story. They can be part of our story. When throughout the season we say things like Kate coming out of the elevator in, uh, in uh, Broken Arrow saying, True or false? Normandy in 1944, Allied invasion. You were on French soil when it happened. Too bad inventory I asked for. Uh -huh. Magnus doesn't answer the question. In Requiem, we talked about the fact that she was there and she was instrumental uh, when, uh, uh, when all the talks were going on about the, the war and, and, you know, some of the Nazis weren't human and things like this. There's another time when uh, they're down in the wine cellar and uh, they're looking for the, the uh, devamper that uh, Tesla has. And uh, Magnus pulls out a bottle and looks at it and says, oh. 45 Bordeaux, bastard. That was a gift from Winston. Churchill, D-Day, long story. But I mean, we get to tell that story. We get to tell what that story is that Magnus was talking about. You realize this is the only, only kind of hero that we could have that has been through all this kind of stuff. There's been lots of wars. There's been lots of tipping points. Magnus was responsible for half of them. In Normandy, we got to explore that. And that, for me, as a, as a, uh, both as a producer and a director, was a very cool part. Once I pitched that out, I, I felt this instant uh, responsibility to not blow it, to not screw it up, and to be authentic and real. If you're doing revisionist history, it only works if you really know what the real story was. Anyway, I was, became a bit of a war buff. And I just completely, like no other script I'd ever written, did I sink my teeth into this kind of factually. Because when you start to deviate, you have to know when you're being disrespectful and when it's sort of, it's okay. And the fun thing was when I pitched the show, uh, the, the network got freaked out because the pitch was not like, here's four or five pages explaining what the story is and how it turns and this is what it is. I sent cablegrams and telegrams with all the, I mocked up, you know, eyes only, Supreme, you know, from the, you know, Eisenhower's desk, Winston Churchill, a letter from Helen Magnus, and then a Nazi cable to Berlin saying we've, we've captured uh, Helen Magnus and then, you know, a, 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 you know, a secret communique from Magnus back to Eisenhower saying, you know, we're, we're, we've been, you know, we're, we're Nazi hands and mission failure and all this stuff and sent it to both sci-fi and space. Instead of a regular four-page pitch, I sent in these fake documents that looked like they were from World War II. And um, they, they wrote back and went, cool, what's the story? And I was like, did you read the telegram to Himmler from you know, the SS commander in Carrington. And they're like, what's the story? And I, well, so I ended up saying, look, uh, you get the idea. They're in Nazi-occupied France, and stuff happens, and Druid's there. And I'll write the outline. They said, please. Um, but I had a lot of fun. So I had a lot of fun immersing myself into the, that whole uh, uh, time in history. What we learned from Cali in Mumbai was that we can turn our little tiny parking lot into a back lot. So we've got a big blank studio wall, which you will probably remember as Djibouti's port, which was the same thing Amanda used for hers, which was the walls in, in uh, Mumbai, uh, which, I mean, uh, a, a, any number of uh, alleyways that we've had, that's where it is. Um, in fact, we, in, we included the loading bay, which was where Drew it in, in Sanctuary for All, the pilot, killed the prostitute. I mean, it's all the same place for us all the time. Martin came to me and said, parking lot. And he said, from the loading dock to the end of the building. And I went, OK. <laughs> and uh, started drawing. The construction worked, I believe it was every weekend for about six weeks just to get it done. And even then, we were, um, we were scrambling at the end to get the final coat of paint to let um, set deck has some time to get in and do their magic. Um, yeah, it was a scramble. <laughs> when we decided to build Carrington, and the show was so big, it just cost us so much, so we had to make it smaller than we wanted to. 
uh, which forces me to do more than I wanted to with the camera to hide the fact that it is only one street. In fact, I think in the end it, we, it ends up looking like five streets, but we only had one street to do it in. So what we ended up doing was I had uh, cutting pieces, we call them cutting pieces, where they're architectural pieces that you can move into the, the, the center of the street or something like that to give you a different look. Well, it's basically a structure that you can move around. It's, they were, um, I guess, about 15 feet wide and about uh, 25 feet high, built on a corner, placed on a, a trolley so they could be uh, moved by the carps into, into the shop when it was required. If you look closely in Normandy, when Watson gets shot, uh, uh, when he picks up the grenade and lobs it, we're facing a direction that is really the only direction that is real because facing the other direction is a green screen. Um, and I had to have the car drive away, the car with, uh, that Nigel was driving and Magnus is in the back of. So all I did was I had it drive up, pick them up, drive out this way, and then I turned the car around and I put the camera close enough to the back of it. You really didn't see very much. And I took a big Nazi flag. Uh, actually, I put the Nazi flag up, a uh, big Nazi banner, and had them drive toward it. So you thought, okay, well, that's the opposite end of the, the street that we were on before. So when Magnus drives away, you actually believe that there's two ends to the street. And of course, there's not. There's just the one end, but different dressing. When Damien first suggested doing Normandy, the very first thing I said when he said, we should do something about Normandy, I said, and we'll get a tank. And we'll do this thing in a tank right off the bat, where it'll be like Magnus in a tank. The, the, the teaser will be Magnus coming out of a tank. She blows something up in it. And he goes, we're never going to get a tank. We're not going to get a tank. But we found a Russian tank nearby in Chilliwack at a museum. And um, uh, so the production designer went out to take a look at it to see if they could make it look like uh, a German tank. And uh, she came back and she said, yeah, it's great. You got you to gotta have a ride in it. And I went, we need to do a sky ride. OK, so so far in my career, I've been able to fly a T-38 fighter jet, the uh, F-5 version of the fighter jet. Uh, I've been in um, uh, a MiG-29 that I've been able to fly in. Uh, I've been in a, an F-16. Uh, I've sat in and got dragged around in a movie on uh, an F-15E. So that sort of takes care of the fighter jet portion of uh, my life. Then I was in, uh, I've been in two submarines. Uh, one, a Russian Foxtrot submarine, where I had to uh, hide inside a torpedo tube uh, with a camera in front of me for a shot. And uh, I've been in a US Los Angeles class uh, submarine at the North Pole. Not a lot of people can say that. And today I get to drive a tank. <laughs> and everybody went, wait, 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 wait. Oh, I have to find out if we can shoot in it. And things like that. And it's, it's like, OK. And I go to my bucket list and I go, check off riding in a tank. I have to tell you that, that um, <clears throat> when, I, when I thought about this at the beginning, when I said to Damien, let's do this with a tank, I thought, oh, Amanda's going to love this. Amanda hated it. I've got to be honest, I've been in tanks before, so the, uh, there was no real, ooh, I'm going to get to be in a tank, because I've, I've been there and I've done that, so I'm sort of cynical. Uh, it's a very cramped metal box. They're so tiny. Like, you squeeze in and you're sitting there, and then he says, and there's a guy sitting below you. The gunner is below you, and you're going, what? There's like a guy's head right here? And then, yeah, right here, there's a guy's head. And then the driver's up here, and you go up and you go, a human being can't fit in there. And says, well, there's kind of a limit on how tall you can be if you're a tank driver. It's insanely tight. Plus, we had one of the hatches open. And this is an authentic old tank. So all the smoke was coming in and then coming into this little metal coffin. A uh, tank, until it's really warmed up, puts a lot of smoke in the air. And she was in the spot right where the exhaust came back into the tank. So we were breathing in smoke and dark, and the, it's lurching up this road. So it was not fun. I have to be honest, it was not fun. So we flip open the hatch, and out I come, green to the gills and ready to, you know, be sick on the side of the tank. And Peter Wingfield, who's never been in a tank before, as who was riding outside of it, is like, Whoa! And I come out like, over it. Come on, just get the shot. <laughs> well, the transformation to Captain Jack Zimmerman from me, from you know, trying to differentiate it from, from Will, I think the idea from the, the outset was we're not going to try to make 
me look like a completely different person. I think we, we, we were never going to try to fool the audience and, and make them think that it wasn't Robin Dunn playing that role. This is the scariest thing I've ever done on Sanctuary. Uh, and that's saying a lot because I've done a lot of crazy things, but uh, this takes the cake. So we're about to see a transformation uh, from Will Zimmerman to Captain Jack Zimmerman, my grandfather. Here we go. There was several things that we did. Um, first of all, all we, obviously the, the hair was different. The hair was, was colored different and, and styled differently uh, in, in that 40s style. And, and as simple as that sounds, that was the f kind of the first thing we went through. And, and immediately, uh, I looked much different. And then um, in terms of makeup, we did sort of different shading, different types of things, all very subtle, but just to kind of give the, the face different, make the nose kind of different. And, and, um, and then we put contacts in, which was very bizarre for me because you're looking at yourself in the mirror and it's kind of, it's like you're looking at someone else that kind of looks like you, but you know, it's, it's, it's very bizarre. And then what we did was we took, um, we took like a, uh, we got a, a mouth piece made, um, sort of a, a tooth thing for my mouth that fit into my, molded to my, te my, my teeth and, and fit into the bottom lip. And it just kind of gave me a little bit of a, you know, something in my mouth. And again, it was very subtle, but it, it, it changed sort of the way I, I talked. And it also, it changed the shape of my face. And, and I remember looking in the mirror and going, wow, wow, this is different. And then what you do is you take, you take all that, all those, thi all those details, and then put this military uniform on, which immediately changes your posture, changes the way you carry yourself, changes even the way you talk, because it's this strange thing about wardrobe, costumes, that um, they almost possess you. All of those things were really, really helpful to me to sort of not play Will and, and play a relative of Will. I, I feel like the transformation was pretty, you know, pretty significant in, in, when you add up all those small details. When we do episodes for Sanctuary, I have to approach them two different ways. <clears throat> First and foremost, I, I, I do it as a director because it, that's my nature. And then the director part of me gets throttled back by the producer part of me. <laughs> Which, which has sort of Damien and Amanda pulling on both arms, too. Martin's really hard on himself. I'm really hard on myself. Amanda's really hard on herself. We're just that kind of miserable bunch that, you know, constantly uh, make each other crazy. But that's how I think good television's born. And Normandy is that perfect example of Martin just directing the hell of it and, and the, the cast just biting right into those moments and, and giving his really cool, poignant, wonderful uh, scenes. What I like about Martin is that He's been directing for a really long time, and he keeps reinventing himself. Here we go. It's not something that you notice in the way that he handles the crew or the set or the cameras. It's the way he shoots. And it's so subtle, but it's so different. And every year, he tries to find a new way into it. To watch a guy take an episode with such scope, like Normandy, and take it from the page and really transforms it into this sweeping, huge, epic show where you have tanks driving down and you have g guys in Nazi uniforms and you're in a tiny sliver of a parking lot. All these amazing things that we're doing on, you know, not a huge budget. Um, but getting that, getting that richness and that, um, that really sort of movie quality. And that's what Martin brings to the table. Martin is like the, the visionary. He really dreams big, and he knows every single facet of what everyone's supposed to do. So as an actor, he'll talk to you as an actor and tell you really great directions. Um, and he's really able to just have an amazing vision of what he wants. For me, coming into an episode like Normandy, the different sort of things that Will has gone through, it, it really is scary as an actor to come in and, and have to really change that way. And to come in and know that Martin is there and know that he is watching and know that um, you know, you're really safe in that environment is, is unbelievably relieving. There's a certain amount of ease that's inherently in a, a Martin Wood production 
because he's he comes in so prepared. He has he has a finger in, because he's part of the triumvirate. He has a finger on every aspect of the making of the show. And action. I'm a seat of the pants director every day I direct. Um, there's days when, when, you know, when you're exhausted or you're, you're, and you, you want to just fall back into that kind of, oh, I just want to shoot this scene like this. And quite honestly, whenever I get like that, I berate myself so badly that I have to do something in the scene to try and twist it because I can't, I can't stand being complacent in directing. And it was interesting to watch him go through the process uh, because you knew he wanted to do something completely spectacular with it and you knew that he was stressing about it and you knew he was going to make an epic war movie in 44 minutes. Tell a beautiful story. Deal with the sci-fi element of it. Deal with the historical element of it. Deal with the we're in the middle of a war element. And he was vibrating the entire, like to go, Martin and I know each other so well that we just, you know, it's like a look, and I go, oh, yeah, okay. But to walk up to him, there's this literally palpable vibration around him the entire time he shot Normandy. Even after doing, you know, a couple of hundred hours of television, you start looking at it and going, why doesn't this get any easier? Well, it's because your brain just keeps making things bigger because you know how to do that. And if I was doing stuff now that I was doing originally when I first started working on television as a director, I could do it like with both eyes tied behind my back and both hands tied like where my eyes are because it would be too easy. I think the way Martin directed Normandy was just incredibly, um, it was deft. It was, it was, it was like a masterwork. It was, it was him at the top of his game. It was him saying, I'm going to give you an amazing feature film in 44 minutes. And, and he took easily our biggest episode and put everything on the screen. It doesn't look like anything we've ever shot before. I mean, we desaturated the color, and it's just a really interesting palette that we're using to tell the story. The war sequences, the, the fight sequences, the guns, the bombs, the... It's phenomenal, the way he shot it. And one of the notes we always get from one of our networks is, uh, what are the stakes? And they said, well, uh, you know, we said, well, if, if we don't find this weather machine and stop it, it'll it'll scuttle the invasion and the note came back what are the stakes of this i don't know if there are any higher stakes than the failure of uh you know defeating um nazism it's an amazing time in history and i think i was always clear that i was never going to turn it into a fun piece of sci-fi entertainment without it being respectful and not just in the subject matter but also in the dedication that was very important i would i don't think i would have been comfortable doing the story if we didn't do the dedication at the end so that everybody knew that we weren't just sort of you know, getting our jollies. We were actually doing it for a reason. We wanted to make a statement, and uh, we wanted to be able to, uh, you know, pay our respects.